So how what we learn from that is how much of the um, of the challenge we face of the warfare happens or begins in the mind and it's harnessing and doing warfare in our mind and it goes from there from from heart and out and and everywhere else but he talks about weapons of warfare and of course in ephesians 6 1 verses uh, uh 1 to 10 sorry 10 to 18 that's the wrong thing it's 10 to 18 he lists those weapons as the belt of truth the breastplate of righteousness the shoes fitted ready for the readiness of the gospel of peace the shield of faith the helmet of salvation the sword of the spirit which is the word of god and prayer as a weapon and um, we've looked as you know we've looked at truth we've looked at righteousness and uh, gospel of peace today the bottom line in all of this friends is we're in a battle we're contending we're in a battle contending for the kingdom of god against the demonized kingdom of this world the kingdom of this world is demonized the kingdom of this world still is where the enemy of god and the enemy of man has influence of course within that we see signs of the kingdom of god we've been seeing signs of god's presence signs of the kingdom ever since jesus came to earth but the kingdom of this world is not yet or now we're near fully under the rule of God. But it will be one day. One day heaven and earth will become one. One day the kingdoms of this world will give way to the kingdom of God. And we are now in that between time where we, God has invited us to partner with him. He's entrusted us as his children to partner with him in seeing and being instruments of bringing more of the kingdom of god to earth but when we do that we will face opposition and that's why we need these weapons of warfare but we're in a battle let's not mistake we're in a battle but what's the good news the good news is there's a fundamental difference between when we're battling for the kingdom of god and the battles we face in the kingdoms of this world and the difference is this you see the battles in the kingdom of this world we have no guarantee that we'll win the battle will we we hope we will uh you know some of you may remember you'll probably be very young or you'll know stories from your parents or that of uh you know around the time of the second world war you know how scary that was there were you know it got really scary you know by japanese and submarines in sydney harbor darwin and all that you know imagine if we didn't win that how different our country might be today we hoped we would we prayed we would but there were no guarantees but let's sort of take them out of the big picture the little picture even when you're having an argument with someone you're going to go guarantee that you'll win it will you you hope you will you might do you win some you lose some you give your best but there's no guarantee but that's the difference with the kingdom of god that's why it is so important that we get an understanding a greater revelation as to how to harness these weapons because when we are using these weapons for warfare in the way that jesus intended us to use them in the way that god does we can't lose we cannot lose when we are using these weapons in the way god tends when we use these weapons the attempts of the enemy to keep the kingdom of this world in his control is weakened and weakened and weakened that's why it's really important we understand that we use these as the lord intends and that's why where do we do when we want to find out how to use these the way the lord intends we go back to jesus when paul taught about this all paul everything paul taught in his letters was not in isolation but was seeking to bring greater revelation and understanding of the person of jesus of the work of jesus not in isolation when we read paul's teaching here about weapons of warfare to understand it we go back to jesus because he modeled everything for us about what it means to live and serve and understand and teach and reveal the kingdom of god 
So that's why we go back to him. And that's what we're doing. And so remember, we've had a look at truth a few weeks ago. What are we truth? Truth, exercising that weapon, is asking, seeking, Lord, what do I need to understand that I don't understand? What is hidden from me that needs to be revealed? What do I understand? What am I not seeing? It's not just saying I put on the belt of truth and give it to me, but no, we've got to seek to understand because the Spirit, Jesus promised, would guide us into all truth. So that's why that's really important. Righteousness, that is about seeking what is the motivation of God god's heart in this situation it's righteousness as defined by god not defined by human standards not defined by the human legal system the human legal system might decide righteousness is you go to jail and don't get me wrong we have to live under the laws of the land but for that person in prison what's the heart of god god loves that person God never gives up on that person. For someone who offends you and they pay the consequences for it and they may do the wrong thing, that's, and you might think, well, righteousness is done. But what's God's heart? What's God's motivation towards that person? It comes from a heart of unconditional love and faithfulness and I'll talk about that more later as we now move to really this other weapon of the shoes for the gospel of peace what exactly this mean let's just read exactly as we find it in Ephesians chapter 10 verse 15 as Paul is talking about these weapons he's talked about the belt of truth the breastplate of righteousness and he says this and as shoes for your feet having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. There are three key words there. Shoes, gospel, and peace. It's really interesting. So why would he say that? Well, what are shoes for? What does a song say? These shoes are made for walking. <laughs> That's exactly right. This is about the sending. The gospel will not be proclaimed if those who already know Jesus stay in their own little huddle, just hang around with Christians and go to church and stay away from the big bad world. Sometimes we heard teaching of that. You know, when I was growing up, there were some extreme churches and that who wouldn't let their children associate with anyone who wasn't a Christian or go anywhere and they wouldn't associate with anyone who weren't good Christian people. You know? Um, and, and, and we, you know, we, we were stayed locked in the fortress of the church. How is the gospel going to be proclaimed if we don't take it to where people are who need to hear it? So what this is about here is about the sending. What did Jesus say? Go and make disciples of all nations. Mark version, go and to all the world and preach the gospel to, good, to all creation. Why? Because the gospel is good news. We are living in a world on a one-way path to self-destruction. Why are we still here? Why haven't we given up? Why haven't we all slit our wrists long before now? Because we have hope. Because we know that nothing in this world has the last word. Because we know that there is a deposit of the presence of God in us and one day we will gain our full inheritance and that is eternity forever with God. We have this incredible treasure in these jars of clay. But Jesus says, share the treasure so that others too may know it. That reference, I believe, shoes for the readiness of peace, I reckon it's a throwback to these words in Isaiah, these prophetic words from the prophet Isaiah 52. How beautiful on the mountains are the feet of him who bring good news, who proclaim peace, the gospel of peace, who bring good news of happiness, who proclaim salvation, who says to Zion, your God reigns. What a prophetic word of the coming, what the coming Messiah would bring and who the coming Messiah would be. And he has entrusted that message to us, friends, to take it to the world. We have good news. 
we have good news that the storyline played out in this world is not the last word but it has to be taken and it is a gospel of peace why because when the good news is proclaimed and when people receive the good news and own the good news what flows peace when people receive the good news they know peace with God and when people know peace with God then they can come to, know, come to know peace within themselves and when they come to know peace within themselves they have within them the capacity to enable peace with others so it's a win-win situation the gospel is good news because the gospel is the means of God reconciling the world to himself through Jesus and again we can know the peace that God always intended us to know when he created us and he created the world so this is why this is such a powerful weapon this is a no-brainer but the gospel is a powerful weapon of our warfare but the point Paul's making it's only powerful if it's shared but now I want to really unpack this more it's really important to do this because this is where it freaks a lot of Christians out oh it's all right for so and so they're just so bold they just have this capacity to talk and share Jesus with others I wish I can't do that I'm not oh so and so they're great but I don't know the Bible as well as they do I can't oh so and so is really good they ask those curly questions and they know how to answer but I can't maybe I've got other gifts oh there we go one of the gifts is the gift of evangelist I haven't got that gift so whew, I'm off the hook yay thank you Jesus I'll just go doing what I want to do I don't have to share the gospel yeah sorry yeah wrong locked in the wrong answer Eddie to that one yes there is the ministry of an evangelist that is a ministry gift and there are as a special anointing for sharing that but you know when Jesus said before Jesus ascended to heaven what were some of his last words as recorded in the beginning of the book of Acts you will be my witnesses but wait he said wait till the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you will be my witnesses to Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth you will be my witnesses see proclaiming the gospel friends is not just when we think it's probably the words preach and proclaim we immediately think of Billy Graham and you think well that's not me so I can't preach the gospel nonsense preaching the gospel yeah that is a form of preaching the gospel what I'm doing now when I'm teaching is a form of preaching but when you are witnesses to Jesus in word and in deed through how you live the example you live your life you are in fact proclaiming the gospel in ways beyond what you can even see but you've got to do it you are called to be a witness let's go and want to do is have a look at the passages as you know with every one of these weapons we've been looking at the same passages they're there everywhere but just to pick a few to, as examples to how Jesus did this so we can see how Jesus used the weapons of his warfare here so let's go and have a look again at those passages in Luke chapter 5 okay the first one remember we looked at Luke chapter 5 verse 12 remember we've looked at it a few times now Jesus cleansed the leper you will know Luke 5 so well by the time we finish this series won't you okay so let's look at this one this is where Jesus cleansed the leper Luke 5 from verse 12 while he was in one of the cities there was a man full of leprosy and when he saw Jesus he fell on his face and begged him Lord if you will you can make me clean and Jesus stretched out his hand and touched him saying I will be clean and immediately leprosy left him 
And he charged him to tell no one, but go and show yourself to the priest and make an offering for your cleansing as Moses commanded for proof of them. Okay. How did Jesus proclaim the gospel here? Through healing. The gospel is preached, yet through words, but through demonstration of signs, through testimony, the way the gospel was, Jesus proclaimed the gospel here, was to heal him. That was, imagine the good news, because the gospel's good news, right? Imagine the good news that this man heard. Just remember the situation. Disease had ravaged this man's life. That was bad enough. But remember, the religious people had told him it was his fault. He was unclean. And no other good religious people could associate with him. Imagine the pain that that man experienced. Imagine the, for his family. He was made an outcast because of this and was made to feel it was all his fault. In come Jesus with some good news. One, it's not your fault. Secondly, it's absolute utter nonsense that this was God's work for you. This comes from no one else but the enemy. And B, C, because I'm God, I'm going to heal you. And he did. What a powerful sign of good news that would have been. Not only that the man was delivered from that hideous disease, but to know, more importantly than that, he was loved by God. He was accepted by God. So see why this was a powerful weapon of warfare? This man now knew peace and he knew healing. And the enemy lost out. The enemy lost out on a number of grounds. One, he was keeping this man oppressed in his sickness. But B, he was keeping the whole community deceived into thinking that this was obviously he brought it on himself and he must be separated and be treated as an outcast. You see, there are times when the best way to proclaim the gospel is actions, not words. And I'm not only talking about physical healing. Sometimes you may proclaim the gospel of peace by just saying something that releases healing to others. It just may be, for example, for that person who has been a very difficult person and continues to shoot themselves in the foot and is not accepted by others and offends you to be able to say, it's okay. To be able to say, you're forgiven. For someone who is just cast out by the society, for someone to say, it's okay, you're loved. You see, again, we've got to be careful that we don't understand narrow preaching the gospel. Okay? Because often we think and, and that to preach the gospel, and, and that's the way I was trained as a teenager, and, and don't get me wrong, I'm fully, fully thankful for this training. But often we think preaching the gospel is learning to be able to say, Hi Dawn, my name's Mark. Do you know Jesus? If you don't, do you know he has a wonderful plan for your life? He loves you with an everlasting love. And do you know what? God loves you so much that he gave Jesus to die for you. And that you know what? It's great because this is a gift. It's not something you have to earn. But when you accept his love and you accept what he's done for you, the scriptures say we are born again. We're born, and that means that God's spirit leads, lives in us. What do we got to do for this? Guess what? All it is is say, Lord, I trust you. Lord, I'm sorry for my sin. I'm sorry for messing up, and I trust you. And that's his promise. Or a version of that. Now, get me wrong. I've done that. There's a place for it. When God, not just necessarily in that form, and hopefully... I wouldn't do it just by that without listening to the person and their story and responding to them. 
you get my point. I'm not talking about I would talk at them rather than listen. But what I'm saying is we're often taught that we don't fully share the gospel if all of those components are there. The trouble is when we do that, we're in our head, not our heart. We're not listening. We're not listening to what God's doing. We're not listening to the other person's story. You know, I've seen with respect some really well-meaning, fervent, passionate Christians so passionate about telling Jesus' story that they're not actually listening to the person's story. Because if we get out of our head and actually listen heart to heart, God will give us what we need to share. And it doesn't have to be the whole package every time. Just saying, God loves you. Or, look, can I pray for you? Because I believe God heals. Can I pray for you? Or, if that's not right, can I ask, you know, at that time, look, I'm a Christian. Do you mind if I ask my church to join me in praying for you? Who has ever done that and it's opened up doors for ongoing conversations? See, that's because doing nothing just gives the enemy to keep people where they are. Sharing the gospel of peace doesn't just have to be bringing it home. It's always great when that happens. Don't get me wrong. Whew. When someone really wants to accept Jesus as their Savior, and we have the absolute privilege of praying for them. Don't get me wrong. Yes. But you see, the Holy Spirit does a better job than us in bringing all this together. Your reaching out in love and grace could be the start where he sets up a divine appointment with someone else down the track who comes along and just waters that seed more, another Christian down the track. Yeah, it's nice to bring it home, but guess what? You have no idea how many people have really led people to the Lord where you have started the process running. But we've got to be there and share. In this case, it was healing, was the, 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 the way that Jesus shared the gospel. Let's look at another one. That was a massive sidetrack, a lot of that, by the way, but that's okay. Um, let's look at the other story. Jesus heals the paralytic. On one of those days, this is from Luke, verse 17 of Luke 5, on one of those days as he was teaching, Pharisees and teachers of the law were sitting there who had come from every village of Galilee and Judea and from Jerusalem. And the power of the Lord was with him to heal. Hear that? The power of the Lord was with him to heal, but he didn't straight away. Let's listen. And behold, someone were bringing on a bed who uh, a man who was paralyzed, and they were seeking to bring him in and lay him before Jesus. But finding no way to bring him in because of the crowd, they went up onto the roof and let him down with his bed through the tiles into the midst before Jesus. And when he saw their faith, he said, Man, your sins are forgiven you. And the scribes and the Pharisees began to question him, saying, Who is this who speaks blasphemies? Who can forgive sin but God alone? When Jesus perceived their thoughts, he answered, Why do you question in your hearts? Which is easier to say, Your sins are forgiven to you, or to say, Rise and walk, but that you may know the Son of Man has authority to forgive sins. And then he did say to the man, Rise up and walk, and he did. How did Jesus preach the gospel there? He told them who he was. Here he was with a packed house of religious leaders who were out to get him. They were waiting for a wrong word. They'd heard and he was, he was upsetting their nice little religious behaviours by all that he was doing, by healing people and talking about being a Messiah and doing all this strange teaching. They were out to get him. But two ways he preached the gospel there. He said, your sins are forgiven. Some people just need to know that. Do you know what? Sometimes the powerful way of preaching the gospel was when someone says to you, oh, gee, well, the roof would cave in if I walked into a church. I'm not, oh, you know, no, you know, I'm going. They joke. Yeah, I know. There's only room for me in the other place. And, you know, we've heard it all. And uh, guess what? Plenty of room for you in heaven, mate. And guess what? Um, God loves you. God loves you. No. You know, the roof wouldn't cave in. You know what? God would be absolutely awesome, think that was awesome. 
if you came in because he just loves us all hanging out with him. You know, sometimes letting people know, ah, oh, but you don't know what I've done. No, that's right, but you don't know what I've done. <laughs> and God's forgiven me. Ah, oh, but he couldn't forgive this. You want to bet? You know how the conversation goes. Just letting people know that there is not one sin they can imagine that is stronger than the love of God for them. Just letting people know that, as Jesus did there. But the second thing he did, he declared the Messiah is in your midst. And some of the ways are just to those people. Whether they accept it or not was up to him. And some of the ways we share the gospel is just letting people know. You know, you talk about the man upstairs, but guess what? He's with us now. And he can be within us. He's here. See what I mean? The, and, and just, it may not. It's Yes, it's the gospel of peace only becomes when people respond to it. But because it is a gospel of peace, we have opportunities everywhere to share it in the ordinary and the everyday circumstances of life and the people we come across. But I'll reiterate, we've got to be among them. And this time, I'm going to read the account that immediately follows, because in the context of this, I think it's important. In Luke 5, the account that immediately follows from verse 27 of chapter 5 is the calling of Matthew, the calling of Levi. After this, he went out and saw a tax collector, collector named Levi sitting at the tax booth, and he said, follow me. And leaving everything, he rose and followed him. And Levi made a great feast in his house. And there was a large company of tax collectors and others reclining at the table with them. And the Pharisees and the scribes grumbled at his disciples saying, Why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? And Jesus answered, Those who have are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but the sinners to repentance. See, the thing that did their heads in more than anything was Jesus just loved to hang out with sinners. He just loved to hang out with people that they had rejected and it got so up their noses because it didn't make sense because their definition of how religious people act, he was just blowing it all out of the water. So I know it's the obvious. But let's, the biggest way that we will keep motivated to exercising the weapon of the gospel of peace is to never, ever, ever, ever forget that Jesus was a friend of sinners. And he didn't have any hassle hanging out with them. For a start, we all are anyway, sinners, saved by grace, right? So there we go. But he had no hassle in hanging out with sinners. And it's really, really, really important to remember that. Last week, I know, and because I've heard from you all and we've talked about in that, last week, I'm sure that uh, a lot of us were disappointed with the decision of the Queensland Parliament. Yep. But what I want to say to us is this. And I remember I said the same thing with the gay marriage decision. Don't forget those who are caught in the crossfire in this. Never forget those on the ground who may make decisions that we don't believe are contrary, or what we believe are contrary to the will of God. But they need God's love and acceptance and forgiveness. And that'll only happen when we hang out with them. You understand what I'm saying? And that's why I worded it the way I did. That when we finish here very soon, we're going outside. And we're going to play a pray an awesome blessing on every person who walks down there at night. Look, don't get me wrong. If you think I'm sounding really self-righteous, I'll 
easily admit to you, I've got totally ticked off with them as well. I've said my bit and I've got my frustration and I've, if I see them and that I've gone through those moments, please rest assured I have. But the Holy Spirit's also convicted me of my attitude and reminded me what I've been preaching the last six weeks. <laughs> and I think, no, this is it, isn't it? This is it. Because let's just take our eyes off the problem for us and the problem for our landlords who couldn't be more cooperative, bless them, and ask ourselves, what might be going on in those people who choose to do that? What's their home-like life, if they even have one at all? What motivates people? What's going on that motivates people to do senseless, senseless damage? You understand what I'm saying? They are not bad people. They are doing, they are engaging in unresourceful behaviour and illegal behaviour. And don't get me wrong, if they're caught, I would believe that the full force of the law, they need to suffer the consequences as we all do. Don't we? But what's going on in their hearts, we don't know. Let's pray. Lord, bless these people. Whatever is motivating, we have no idea what their lives are like, but bless them. When we come with a heart of love and a heart of grace, let's pray, oh God, move within their hearts. If we have that attitude, wow, what a difference it makes. When we can check our own emotions and come in the opposite spirit. Because there is never any guarantee... for justice this side of eternity is there there's no guarantee great as our legal system might be there is still no guarantee that it can bring justice i'm sure bob could tell you story after story after story of what he experienced in his role um and uh and where justice didn't prevail But with the kingdom of God, justice always prevails. And when we come in that spirit from the righteousness of God, from the heart of God, with the love of God, Lord bless, come in the opposite spirit. The enemy's power is earthed. Because God is love. And love breaks through. Because God so loved the world, he gave his only son, so that all who believe in him may not die, but have everlasting life. Let's, armed with the, let's put our shoes on. In other words, be ready to wherever we go with the gospel that brings peace. Amen.